I see a red dot in the corner of my screen and I believe we are now recording. Um, so with that, I do need to, okay, good. I'm seeing other people giving me the thumbs up that they do see, they see a recording thing. Uh, okay, all right, so far so good. Um, yeah, so by the way, we are recording. So everybody should be aware that, uh, you know, um, this will be uh, recorded for posterity and shared on the website um, with all of the other chairs lectures, except for the one that, that I missed, Keith, that I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, with that, um, I'll kick off by giving Aunt Tamsin a bit of a bit of an introduction, and then um, Tamsin can take it away. So, uh, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Tamsin Blewett, who's one of our most recent additions to the Department of Biological Sciences. And I'm going to give a little bit of background. And I normally can find something outside of the CV in my internet scrape, but I actually didn't for Tamsin. So, Tamsin, I'm, I might ask you uh, to start with. I, I believe you are originally from Southern Ontario. And I, I see yeah, from your right. track record that that's where you started. But I, I don't, I, where did you go to high school? Where are you from? I'm from Owen Sound, Ontario. So uh, north, I guess somewhat Northern Ontario. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, I'll take it you grew up there, but uh, you did your first degree or your, it was a bi biology major chem minor at uh, Wilfrid Laurier, right? Um, then a master's and a PhD at McMaster. And oh, Wilford, Wilford Laurier, you actually started working in the area of uh, physiology or ecotoxicology with uh, Deb McClatchy, who was your, your supervisor, I understand, who is now the president of that, that institution. Um, um, then you went to McMaster to do a, a master's and then a PhD in the same lab with uh, Chris Wood, who um, many people may have heard of, who's probably one of Canada's most prolific physiologists, ecotoxicologists, um, something like 700 papers, a towering figure in the field. Um, so you did both of your, um, your, both of your graduate degrees at McMaster, a short stint as a postdoc at Laurier, and then a P, uh, an NSERC funded postdoctoral fellowship here at the University of Alberta in the laboratory of, of Greg Goss, where you, you were until 2019, when we decided we liked you so much, we would make you a faculty member here at the University of Alberta. And we're, we're delighted, absolutely delighted to have you. Um, yeah, and that's what, I, that's what I know about you in my, in my short uh, snippet of, of your potted history. So today, Tamsin is gonna share with us some of the work that she does in the area of marine and aquatic uh, ecotoxicology or physiology. Um, she's going to talk about uh, secret dining habits of crabs. And when I normally hear dining and crabs in the same sentence, I start thinking about garlic butter and, and uh, wearing a bib. But this is actually crabs dining on other things rather than dining on crabs, right? Yeah. I mean, they are cannibalistic, so it could be a little bit. Okay. Oh, well, that, that, that doesn't rule out the garlic butter then. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right. So, so with that, Tamsin, I, I will hand the floor to you and... Um, we look forward to hearing hearing about what you do and why you do it. All right, well, thank you. I'm just gonna see if this works. Can everybody see that okay? Perfect. So yeah, um, as Dave mentioned, uh, I started in April 2019. I got my graduate students in 2020 <laughs> and we all know how that went well. And, but luckily we were able to get to BAM field for a quick field season. So we did get some work done. Overall, I would consider myself a mechanistic toxicologist, but physiology is really the absolute core of that. So I've decided to show you some work that I'm pretty proud of. It's actually the core of my NSERC discovery as well. So one of the most, I guess, harshest environments are estuaries. And crabs, and particularly estuarine crabs, are highly robust animals. They're capable of living in these really harsh environments. And they can withstand extreme variations in water chemistry, such as dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, and they've even colonized terrestrial environments. And now I mentioned that estuaries are highly challenging in temporally variable environments. So again, they fluctuate on a daily and seasonal scale. They have massive variations in temperature. So for example, a tidal pool as I'm showing here, uh, they can go from quite cold temperatures to very warm temperatures over the course of a day. Same with salinity, you can have freshwater inputs from, to all the way to full seawater. You can also get um, effects on dissolved, or, uh, dissolved oxygen, which is the way you can get hypoxia alterations. 
And you can also get tidal currents and exposure of habitats to air. So these are really, really harsh environments. However, if you're able to sustain living in these environments, there could be to, it could be potentially to your benefit. Estuaries, while they are harsh, are really nutrient rich. So they, estuaries get a lot of natural, again, well, estuaries get a not, lot of natural organic matter that is alloxinous. And that's essentially what happens in the winter is leaves fall off the trees, it enters in the environment, and this is very, it's just dissolved organic carbon, dissolved organic matter. There's also autochthonous natural organic matter, and that's bacterially derived, that's occurring within the estuary itself. And there's also entrainment of natural processes. So basically, uh, entrainment is, uh, is seaweeds hitting rocks, so it's naturally releasing organic matter. And all of these processes contribute to elevated dissolved amino acid concentrations in estuaries. So they're particularly fairly nutrient rich. So amino acid concentrations in the open ocean can range from 0.5 to 1 micromolar, so that's total. And then in estuaries, it can range to 2 to 5 micromolar, whereas as high concentrations of about 30 micromolar have been um, recorded. And leucine is one of the um, most abundant in, um, in estuaries. And so if there is this nutrient re resource in estuaries, can estuarine invertebrates utilize this rich source of dissolved nutrients? So that's the question that um, I'm posing. So overall, there are several phyla that can utilize dissolved amino acids. So many soft body invertebrates and a single primitive vertebrate have they been able to take up amino acids across their skin, while hard body invertebrates such as mussels can actually use their gills for this purpose. So by taking advantage of these localized elevations in dissolved organic nutrients, these species have been able to maximize energy resources in a really competitive feeding environment. So we know that about 13 phyla and 18 classes of aquatic biota have displayed this ability to take up nutrients across the skin. However, arthropods were thought essentially that they couldn't do this because of their calcified exoskeleton and relative impermeability to solute and water flux. So right in 1998 wrote, or 1988, pardon me, wrote, marine arthropods appear to be the only taxonomic group of marine invertebrates whose members cannot accumulate natural organic matter. And so, this wasn't really something, we kind of sought out to see if this is actually true. This hasn't really, hadn't really been tested. And so we wanted to know if estuarine crabs could absorb dissolved amino acids. So the crab that we were using is Carcinus minus. Um, they're really amazing uh, decapod crustaceans that can experience large fluctuations in salinity. They can withstand salinities from 4 ppt to 40 ppt, keeping in mind that uh, salinity of seawater is around 32 to 35. They're an osmoconformer and they isoosmotic at 100% seawater, basically meaning that their internal ion balance equals that to the outside environment. And this photo was taken just before tragedy st struck, where the person holding the crab was subsequently pinched. So this is a really good how to not to hold a crab, just as a heads up moving forward. So Corsinus minus are actually an invasive species. And I'm just going to put a pointer on. They're originally from, they're basically based in Scandinavia, but as you can see here, that they're pretty much invasive everywhere, and in fact, they are found on the West Coast uh, more recently. And just to give you an idea, these dots are, um, base, are less than 50 crabs were found there, which I think is actually kind of funny because I have no idea what's going on <laughs> with some sort of weird crab meeting happening over here. But essentially, they're invasive, they're a big issue on both the east and west coast of Canada, and which is good for me because they're abundant. And where we do the research is at Banfield Marine Science Center, which is on Vancouver Island in Banfield, BC. So if you've ever been able to work at Banfield, it's fantastic. Uh, as you can see here, there's ice cream. Uh, the crabs are actually farther out in Pipe Stem Inlet. Uh, physiologists work here on the foreshore, and there are plenty of bears. So I'm just going to go through, and hopefully these videos play, um, giving you an idea of what Banfield is like. Uh, and yeah, if you ever get a chance to do some research out there, I highly suggest it.
So this is what you, this is a view off basically the top of the, um, of the Marine Sciences Center. So it's pretty gorgeous. You know, we've got mountains, we've got the ocean. And then this is uh, basically a view of across the, where the physiologists actually work. So um, this is where the main uh, areas that we work. And as I mentioned, there are bears. So again, this is just right, basically two seconds outside of the lab. You can see a small um, black bear just kind of being curious and then runs off. I probably shouldn't have been videoing to be 100%. I know <laughs> you shouldn't be anywhere near bears, but it was quite interesting because he was pretty close to the lab. So back to the actual question at hand, can estuarine crabs absorb amino acids? So this is obviously a crab. This is Carcinus minus or the green crab. And what's really interesting is that they have nine pairs of gills. So these are our gills on both sides. This is the heart and this is the hepatic pancreas. And so they have two functional types of epithelial cells in the gill. So they have the respiratory cells, which are characterized by a very thin epithelium. And they're usually uh, the anterior gills from two to five, while the posterior gills are thick ion transporting cells, which is, they have the primary role in ion regulation. And so we decided to work with gill eight only, and this is because we know that a lot of amino acid transport is likely tied to ion transport. And so we thought the, the posterior gills would be the most likely site of transport if they were able to transport amino acids. So the gill is actually a really ideal transport surface. Given the fine diffusive distance, the significant surface area, and the high perfusion of the branchial surfaces with hemolymph, they're ideally suited for dissolved nutrient uptake. Now to test this, what we do is a, a closed gill preparation. So to kind of lead you through this, uh, this diagram, so here we have artificial hemolymph, which essentially is mimicking the blood plasma of the crab. It's being perfused or pumped through the gill going into the afferent and then efferent, and then we collect the perfusate. The gill is bathed in seawater as it would be normally if it was in a crab. And so essentially this is considered to be a closed system. And this, what anything that transports from the seawater through the crab gill should be collected in the perfusate. And this is closed by what we like to call it the gill clip. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of this um, moving forward. But we do have to do some, testing of the integrity of the prep because we need to know that this is a closed system essentially that we know that what's ever coming from the water is transported across the epithelium versus just being leaked into the gills say for example from the top the way that we test the, the the integrity of the prep is via a dye test to see if this is a closed system so these are just uh test gills and you can kind of see i wonder if it's going to display hopefully yeah so you can see what we've done is we run dye through the gill and you can see that the gills are actually red, but none of the dye is actually leaking out into our seawater. All of the dye is actually going through into our collected perfusate. So we know that this is a closed system. Furthermore, another way we can test this is by inulin. So inulin is a fairly large polysaccharide. It doesn't transport across the gill epi epithelium. So we used radio-labeled um, C14 inulin as a marker to see if transport was if this was a closed system in addition to the dye test. So essentially what should happen is we shouldn't actually see any radioisotope in our collected perfusate. Um, if we do, then we obviously have a leak in the gill and we can't proceed. So what actually happened? Hopefully that tumbleweed actually goes across your screen, but nothing. So we didn't actually get a radioisotope signal, which is amazing because that means inulin wasn't being transported and we've, we've confirmed that we have a closed prep. So to test, if, to test if the green crabs can take up amino acids across the gill, we've decided to use leucine or radio-labeled leucine. I was going to say, hopefully that starts. Um, and essentially what we're doing is radio-labeled leucine is in the seawater here. And what should happen is leucine, if it's transportable, should be taken up across the gill and enter into our perfusate here. And we'll be able to take, we're doing this radioisotopically, and that way we can get a pretty good idea of whether or not this is transportable or not, given the counts per minute that we get 
from the isotope. So I kind of want to go over some characteristics of carrier mediated uptake pathways. And so I apologize if this is a little bit, um, what do I want to say, a little bit too, um, what am I trying to say? Not as, uh, as technical as it could be. So there are some definite characteristics of carrier mediated nutrient uptake pathways. And the first is that if it's saturable. So what I mean by saturable is that uptake rate is limited by the number of transporters available and the relatively slow rate of translocation across the epithelium. So some things to note is that the KM is your transport affinity. So the higher the KM, the lower the affinity. And then the Jmax is your transport capacity. So it's akin to the number of transporters available to move your substrate across the epithelium. Another characteristic is that it's specific. So only substrates of a certain size or shape can bind at the transporter active site. And then finally, if it's regulated. So if it's regulated, epithelial transport should be responsive to changes in the environment. So an example of this is some change in environmental variable, whether that be feeding or salinity, that sort of thing. So if all these characteristics are present, there's a strong likelihood that there's a specific pathway for nutrient uptake. And we can suggest that they can transport amino acids across their gills. So the first um, part we were looking at is if it was saturable. So the good news is, is that branchial transport of L-leucine displays saturable concentration dependent kinet kinetics. So this is indicative of a specific carrier. The presence of saturation indicates that the movement of amino acid is not from simple diffusion. And therefore, there are specific mechanisms by which L-leucine is being absorbed. More importantly, this is a fairly low affinity, high capacity transport system. And so one thing to note is that our concentration here range is all the way up to about 500 micromolar. And if you can remember at the start of the talk, I said concentration ranges didn't really go above five micromolar for total amino acids. So this is well outside of their, their range. So yes, they are transporting amino acids and yes, um, it is saturable, but these are outside of the environmental concentration. And what's, so what's really interesting is that, yeah, they have a high capacity, low affinity transporter. And I'll maybe mention why I think they have this a little bit later because it comes um, back around. But what I really want to focus on is actually the lower part of the curve. And so they actually have two different transporters. So this is a sigmoidal curve, and this has an uptake affinity constant at 1.7 micromolar. Uh, which is much more environmentally relevant to the concentrations of amino acids in seawater. However, to note, it's not a hyperbolic curve, it's sigmoidal, which usually means either there's allosteric modification or potentially more than one pathway present or homeotropic enzymes that possess one or more active site. So we've, we have proven that there they can transport amino acids. So that's awesome. But is this pathway specific? Now, the way that we test to see if this is specific, we look at the competition by the D isomer. So theoretically, if this was specific, the D isomer should block L leucine and we shouldn't see any transport of L leucine, especially because this effect can be mediated by the direct competition of these amino acids. So guess what happened? <laughs> if there's a competition of the D isomer and we see that uptake of L leucine is actually decreased in the presence of D leucine, which is great because this is indicating that uptake is specific. So now that we know that it is specific, what are some potential transporter for L-leucine? So the specific transport systems that achieve amino acid uptake in crustaceans are not well described. There are relatively, there are, however, some relatively conserved mechanisms of uptake between invertebrate systems studied to date and mammalian amino acid transporters. So what we wanted to do is actually identify the specific transporter that might be involved. Uh, a key aspect of amino acid transporters are that they're kind of promiscuous in that they can transport more than one amino acid. And another characteristic is that some of these amino acid transporters are sodium dependent and some are not. So based on that knowledge and based on what transporters that are present in mammalian, um, in mammalian species, we have an idea of what transporters could be present in crabs that do actually transport leucine. And so for this, 
simplicity's sake, I've just named them A, B, and C, but they actually do have um, different solute carrier names that I can go into with more detail. So there's three possible systems or three possible mechanisms for leucine to get into, um, into the cell or transport across the cell. The first is system A. This is a sodium independent transporter that transports three, uh, three anine and lysine as well, in addition to leucine. System B is a sodium um, dependent transport that only transport lysine and leucine. And then system C is sodium dependent that transports threonine and lysine and leucine. Don't worry, we're gonna go through this pretty systematically. So the first and easiest way to test this is if this is sodium linked because system A is sodium independent. So what we did was we looked at L-leucine under normal conditions, so that's full seawater, which is seawater contains a fair amount of sodium. And then what we did was we bathed the medium in sodium free. And what we can see is that when sodium is removed, it reduces the transport of the amino acid L-leucine. So we know there is a sodium dependence, which means this likely isn't the transport system for, uh, for leucine. So now we have two different, we're testing if lysine is also competitive. So we have two micromolar leucine and what we did is we tested 10 times the lysine concentration and looked at uh, uptake of leucine across the gill. And what was interesting is that lysine did actually block um, L-leucine. So that all that does is confirm to us that it is actually probably system B or system C. So what's really key in this in trying to figure out if it's B or C is actually threonine. And what we found was that threonine reduced leucine uptake as well. And so now we know that it's likely system C because it's sodium dependent, threonine is trans it blocks uh, leucine uptake and so does lysine. So it's evidence of this shared transporter. So we know the pathway is specific, we have the potential transport systems been identified, but is this pathway regulated? So what we did was we fed our, <laughs> fed our boys. As you can see here, they're eating pretty happily. And what we did was we had a controlled experiment pairwise where we fasted crabs, and then we also had crabs that were two to four hours postprandial. Um, essentially, you open up, take the gills, and look at transport, and then same six to eight hours postprandial to look at transport. And what was really interesting is that at both two to four hours postprandial and six to eight hours post postprandial, we see an increase in leucine uptake. And so it is responding to an environmental, um, environmental um, regulator, so to speak. And what's really interesting is that when these guys, um, they eat, this is like a, a nice little salmon dinner, I should say, they actually get, they are breaking up so much of that organic matter and they create these just ridiculous sort of food baths that they are in. And I think it creates this microenvironment of just such a high amount of dissolved uh, amino acids. And we'll get into that a little bit later as to why that's, that's relevant. So for summary for this part, we know that it's stashable. There's a carrier mediated pathway, likely to. We know that it's specific. It's, um, and, and it's a sodium dependent system C and it's regulated. So it did respond to uh, a change in their environment. So they were fed and we saw this uptake of L-leucine increase. So evidence suggests that environmentally relevant concentrations of amino acids are absorbed across the gill in green crabs via specific regulated transport mechanisms. So take that right. I don't really know that person, so that's probably quite rude. <laughs> but I would just say, you know, it's just different, uh, proven, proven wrong, so to speak. So what, is this, what does this mean? Why can they do this? Is it similar to other invertebrates? And so there are some potential hypotheses as to why they can, why they have this ability. So there's potential for um, a nutrition aspect or when they're going through a molt. So when crabs are going through a molt, they're actually quite, um, they're quite open for prey and they can't actively forage themselves. And so the hypothesis is that when they're going through a molt, they have the ability to take amino acids across their gills almost as a way of feeding and can't actively forage for themselves. It could be because of osmolality, so a salinity flux perhaps is used as an organic osmolite. 
and then potentially in hypoxia, some invertebrates use amino acids as energy distribution during a hypoxic event. And so some of the two mechanisms that we've tested are nutrition and osmolality. So I'm going to go through those next. So osmotic regulation. So our hypothesis for this was that lower salinities will cause changes in intracellular amino acid concentrations and result in lower uptake of L-leucine across the gill epithelium. So as salinity decreases, the extracellular fluid osmolality decreases, and this results in an osmotic imbalance between extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid, such that the cell is more osmotically concentrated. This causes water to rush into the cell and the cell swells. So in, in order to maintain or to minimize this cell, the cell, sort of to minimize this, the cell has to dump some of its osmotic content, which it does by efflux of organic osmolites, such as amino acids. So, Retention of ions to balance intracellular osmolality is not favored owing to some inhibitory effects of high on ion, ion concentrations they have, that they have on cellular function. So instead, organic osmolites are generally employed. So to test this hypothesis, what we did was we had several different treatment groups. So we have control normal holding conditions. So they're at 35 ppt, they're happy, same temperature across all crabs. And then we also had so that's our control group. Next, we had 120% seawater, so that's about 41 ppt. So that's at their upper limit of what they can handle in terms of seawater, and they were acclimated for 10 days. Then we had a 20% seawater, 24-hour transfer. What is, and what that means is that we took crabs from 100% seawater and then put them in 20% seawater for 24 hours and then ran our, um, our, gill, our gill perfusions there. And then we also just had a 20% seawater group, which is 6.8 PBT, and we allowed them to be acclimated to that for 10 days. And the same, we had, uh, did our gill preps. We also had some whole body um, preps as well, and I can, I'll show you that in a minute. Just to give you an idea, so this is hemolymph osmolarity on your y-axis and then seawater osmolarity on your x-axis. And they start out, this is the isoosmotic line or one to one line, and they start out to be um, basically isoosmotic with seawater, but as seawater osmolality drops, they do deviate a little bit and start to regulate. And so what happened with salinity? So this is pretty interesting. So on your y-axis, you have branchial amino acid uptake and then the salinity on your X. So this is our 24 hour transfer. This is 20% seawater, 100% seawater, and then 120% seawater. And what's really interesting is that as soon as we dropped the seawater, uh, the salinity of the seawater, trans transport completely collapsed. I thought that I might see increase in 120% seawater, but that was not the case. Um, but it was confirming that it definitely is sodium linked, which again, just going back that this is definitely sodium linked uh, transport. So what's interesting is that we looked at across all gills, and the pattern's the same, which is, uh, again, kind of surprising because I thought the anterior gills wouldn't have the same capacity for transport because they are respiratory in nature versus the posterior gills, which are those gills six to nine, which are ionoregulatory. So what's interesting is that we did see an increase in 120% salinity in the, only in the last gill, gill nine only. And we did see particularly, again, these aren't significantly different, but there is a pattern where it seems like these gills here are transporting a higher amount um, in the 120 seawater, which is kind of weird. So one thing, the reason I think this is happening is to do with water flux. So now the next slide is really bright, so just keep that in mind when it comes up on your screen. And I know this is kind of like a little bit scary. So this is, this is actually a crab that in Belize, and this is a thermal imaging of that crab. These are the crab eyes. It kind of looks a bit scary to be honest. So this is the crab eyes here, and you can see the flux movement. And what this is, well, so what this is showing is that the body of the crab is like, is right here, and crabs take up water through their legs and pump it out through their mouth. And so what we think is happening is that the front gills are actually getting a fair amount of water also from the back gills, and so it's almost exposing them to a higher amount of, um, higher amount of uh, radioisotope just because of the water flux. Because these are whole body crabs, and so they'd be sitting in um, dissolved amino acid, but radio labeled. And so what we think is happening, because the water flux is coming into the bottom of the legs, 
and then moving towards the front of the body, you're almost getting a concentration difference between the front and the back. So this is just showing how basically they move water across the gills. So just a summary of the osmotic regulation hypothesis. So the data in dilute seawater do support hypothesis that increased salinity will increase transport somewhat, but at 120% seawater, that wasn't supported. However, dilute uh, seawater did shut down transport, and so that did confirm some aspects of that hypothesis. So I'm just going to take a break for some water. So next, we really wanted to focus on the nutritional value. So our hypothesis here was that the main function is to maximize absorption during feeding. Then we would see an upregulating of branchial transport will be observed. And so we saw this when we tested uh, the two to four hours postprandial and the six to eight hours postprandial. But what we wanted to do is look at, see if these patterns were observed again through that whole body transport type of experiment. So additional source of nutri nutrients outside of the normal intestinal feeding maximize nutrient absorption when engaged in feeding as well. So I mentioned this uh, previously, but this may supplement during times when the crustacean can't actively forage. So when they're going through a molt, for example. So to test this hypothesis, we fed them again, and we fed for about one hour individually. I know that this is, this is just an example of us feeding time at Banfield. And what we did is we looked at transport of L-leucine across the gills at two different concentrations, two micromolar and 300 micromolar, right at those um, KM right at the affinity uh, constant levels that we tested previously. And so we wanted to look at uptake after 24 hours and observe gill distribution in vivo. So again, to show you what we did, so this is the two micromolar um, presentation before, so it's our low concentration. We wanted to see if this was gonna hold again for a higher concentration at 300 micromolar. And we see the same pattern both two to four hours postprandial and six to eight hours postprandial, they have taken up higher amino acid concentrations uh, comparatively to when they are fasted. Now, we did also see significant increases after feeding in the posterior gills when we tested them in their whole body over the course of 24 hours. So even after 24 hours, we still see higher accumulation of L-leucine in, um, in those back gills, so gill eight and gill nine in particular. And again, we are seeing this similar pattern at the front gills, but again, that could be water flux. So summary of the nutrient hypothesis, crabs increased uptake of L-leucine after ingestion of the meal. And we think that the reason this is always, this is happening at both two micromolar and 300 micromolar is because of that soupy mixture. So that microenvironment that they're creating when they're tearing apart that food, that organic matter. So, the next question that we want to pose, is this just unique to Carcinus or prevalent in other arthropods? So Carcinus is an invasive species and perhaps this is a way to give them some sort of competitive edge. This is my favorite part, <laughs> which is sad because it's, you know, we've got data there and I'm like, oh, this is yes, I'm so ready for this. So you're wondering if this gives them a competitive edge across in comparison to other species. So what about the others? So we looked at other native uh, specific Pacific species, so the Dungeness crab, the red rock crab, and the grateful crab. And before anybody asked, we did not get to eat them, which is a shame. Um, and this work was actually done by MSC student Rob Griffin. And yeah, this is what we were doing this summer in Banfield when we were allowed out briefly to go do some research. And right now, we're only going to focus on Metacarcinus gracilis the graceful crab. And what's really interesting about these guys is that they really are stenohaline. They don't have a very, um, they're not like carcinus and they can withstand large variations in their salinity. So they're quite different in terms of their osmoregulatory strategies. So we wanted to start with the metacarcinus graceless. So just to give you an idea, so this is uptake of L leucine, branchial uptake on the y axis and then your concentration of L-leucine on the x-axis. Purple crabs are graceless, and then carcinus is the green, green crab here. And so what's really interesting is that the KMs are different 
and the JMAX are quite different. There's a fairly large difference between these two crabs. So for example, Metacarcinus has a low transport capacity, but a very high affinity for leucine, whereas Carcinus has a greater transport capacity, but a low affinity. And maybe this is indicative of their environments because Metacarcinus isn't really an estuarine crab, and they're not going to be in those environments where I would say that you have higher dissolved amino acids, and it may have a greater importance in terms of those microenvironments to be mixtures. So Carcinus kind of, while they may not have a high affinity for it, they can certainly transport it a lot better than, say, for example, the, the graceful crab. However, again, this is at high concentrations that you're never going to see in the environment. Maybe you might see in those microenvironments but what's happening at the lower end of the curve. And so we do see another sigmoidal curve. And again, you have uptake of L-leucine on your y-axis and the concentration of L-leucine across the x. And what's really interesting is that we see another sigmoidal curve for both species, but they're actually quite close to each other. So both uptake affinity constants at the lower levels are the same. So around 1.71 for uh, graceless and 1.73 for Carcinus. And so this was actually pretty surprising because I really thought Carcinus kind of excelled in everything in terms of you know, their salinity tolerance, their oxygen tolerance, ammonia tolerance, everything. And then to kind of be, for lack of a better word, basic in comparison to the other, um, other crabs was really interesting. And so this doesn't seem to be, um, at least for the, for the most part, this doesn't seem to be giving them a competitive edge in these environments. And so that was something that I was surprised to see. So moving forward, um, I, we want to be, we have some data on the other species. So we do have some red rock crab uh, data and we do have some of the, um, the Dungeness crab. Uh, we're just getting that put together, but I think we were a little bit hampered obviously by the pandemic. Um, so moving forward, we do want to test more species. The other thing that is critical is we need molecular studies to provide structural evidence for potential amino acids transporters. We need to know if we are on the right track with the transporters that we do have. And it would be nice to have immunohistochemistry to establish where they are actually located um, on the gill. And so I think there's a lot to do moving forward and um, hopefully we'll be able to get out to Banfield this year again, but who knows. But yeah, overall that's, that's where this, this part's at. So that was a kind of quick, but I just wanted to kind of give everybody an update of one of the main projects that, that's going on in my lab. So I really like to thank obviously Rob Griffin because he's leading the, the charge on this. Um, Aaron Boyd who was able to come out um, to Banfield with us. Uh, Chris Glover, Greg Goss obviously for being out there that first Banfield with us. Um, and obviously BMSC staff, Alyssa Weinro, Gary Anderson and Ryan Wave and the rest of the, the Blue Lab. And I'd be happy to take your, your questions. I know that was a quick. <laughs> Thank you, Tam. Um, we have plenty of time for, uh, for Yay. discussion and, and questions. No, I think that, that that's fantastic. It's great. Um, you can either um, wave at me or put your put up your blue hand. Uh, blue hands seem to work the best. And let me just get a sense here. Give people a second. I see, I see John, but Warren had the blue hand first. So we'll go with Warren first and then um, John, you're, you're next. Oh. Well, that's curious. Is anybody, okay, I was gonna say it's not me or? That, that, Warren, you sounded like Mickey Mouse. Your audio, there we go. Um, so um, it, it's very interesting. Um, these transport systems there, it looks like they're kind of reminiscent of some of the bacterial ones where you have a two component system, high affinity, low affinity. So my question is a little bit tangential to that. And that is, do you know anything about the contribution of the, the gill microbiome to the uptake of these things? Where's Lisa? Is Lisa here? <laughs> Lisa Stein. Uh, so there is a side project that we started last year. I took, we took some gills, um, and Lisa was actually going to look at the, the gill microbiome um, in particular, and, I, and it was an undergrad project. And we started that, I think, in 20, 
fall of 2019 and we were supposed to continue, but we didn't have, we just haven't had a chance to get things underway. But yeah, that is something that we're looking at in particular to see the nitrogen producing bacteria and see what's present there. But um, yeah, so we are investigating that, but it's, it's not, we, nothing concrete just yet. Okay, thanks very much. No problem. Okay, now, now John had his real hand up. All right, uh, great talk, um, Tamsin. Um, just looking at your data, I'm just, just, you know, I think it is true that you probably has, have multiple uh, transporters in your, in your system there. And, but I'm just sort of also looking at your uh, competition and elimination process in the beginning. Um, can you actually rule out the existence of your type, you know, type two transporters? I don't think you can. Not, no, not without, so physiologically, it doesn't, yeah, I was gonna say, not without molecular, I feel. Without the backing up of knowing what's actually present on the gill, I don't think we can, and again, we're working off of mammalian transport systems as well. So I think the evidence is suggesting a certain type of transporter, but I think without actually having the molecular to back us up, it would be, it's hard to say that concretely, I would say. Yeah, and, and, and I think you, you probably have a mixture of, of, you know, probably more than two types of, of transporters in there. Just, just yeah, looking no, at the complexity of it. Yeah. But also it, working with uh, alanine as well, transport of alanine, it's a yeah. similar situation where it's like multiple transporter, multiple amino acid transporters can transport multiple different amino acids. And so it's really, a co it's a very, it's a lot more complex system than I, um, I was trying to simplify it for the talk, but it is a much more complex system. Um, now does change in, you know, like, like in, in the, in the uh, uh, other types of crabs in addition to the, the green crab, um, if you do change the in vitro or, or ex vivo uh, perhaps and, and challenge them with different um, salinity, do you think that they're also going to, to exhibit uh, the similar kind of response as your green crab? I'd be interested. Just, I, the, the problem is, is that the, some of, like, the only, the problem is, is that we need a comparable uh, urine inhaling crab to do that with. And the species that we currently have that the Dungeness, the Red Rock and the Graceless aren't really great so at osmo regulating. Like they they're pretty happy being osmo conformers. And so we would be able to maybe test their limits and maybe go to their, I guess, lower limit of salinity to see if we do see a decrease in leucine uptake. I think that would make sense. But they're just it's not the same where we can go such a low salinity or go sodium free because they just don't have the same capacity as the green crab. Right, thanks. Uh, I think Kim has a blue hand up. Thanks for an awesome talk, Tamsin. Um, I have a question also about the, the three different, um, I have to look up my note to make sure I use the right word, the three different pathways you looked at, A, B, and C. The, the first one that you eliminated, I get that it demonstrates that there's some sodium, wait, now I'm going to get it backwards, that there must be some sodium dependent pathways, mm -hmm. but it didn't drop to zero, right? So doesn't that imply that there's still a role for some sodium independent? Am I doing it backwards again? But whatever. No, that's right. That's right. No. So the problem is, is that it's really hard, especially at Banfield, to be sodium free in anything because sodium is so concentrated everywhere, especially in seawater. So I feel like while we say, I probably should have said sodium reduced because we do try to get, like, we make everything up sodium free, but at the same time, there, it's just that you can't get purely sodium free. So I feel like there might have been a little bit of sodium still be still in the system, which is why I think we didn't see a complete shutdown of transport. That's it's, ma it's mainly just an issue of working in, in the field with okay. sodium yeah. being everywhere. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And I see Rich and then uh, Al with his real hand after Rich. Well, thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Tamsin. Um, <clears throat> uh, another thing you neglected to mention about green crabs is they're a whole lot faster than the cancer crabs, so that makes them a lot more difficult to work with because they can give you a nasty pinch extremely fast. So, if you, uh, that's a, an additional reason maybe for working more on some of the other cancer crabs. They're much more. They're much less threatening. Um, so, one thing wasn't clear to me when you you're doing these tests, you're doing them in a, an isolated gill that's removed from the crab. 
how mm -hmm. soon after you remove the gill from the crab do you do those tests? And a, a, correl a correlated question is, have you ever tried doing any of them with a, a dead gill um, to try to get a sense for, for what is total passive dynamics of amino acids and ions and so on across, across gill membranes? So the, it's almost immediate. So as soon as, um, so depending on what our prep is, we kill the crab, dissect the, the gill out and put the prep up. So it's, al it's almost immediate and the preps are only for an hour. Um, so it's, it's quite quick. And then in terms of the dead gill, um, I'm going to give a shout out to Greg on this one because he also made me do this. <laughs> so I was like, this is one of the things we were talking about. But yeah, we do have an idea of what's actually being transported and maybe what might just be passively transported. I, I didn't show that data, but that's something that we have done before with the, the dead tissue before. Okay. It's relatively low uh, comparatively. Still, it doesn't, it's not as, yeah, it's, it doesn't say it's relatively low in terms of transport, which is good. <laughs> Thanks. And I think that, uh, Al, you, you put your hand up, right? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, so th thanks, Tamsin, for a nice talk. You talk about this cloud of stuff that, that comes around the crab as it's feeding. Is there any evidence that, that some of these molecules might sort of signal competitors to come and try and steal food and that by absorbing these back in over the, the gills, it might reduce that signaling? I mean, that's a really good hypothesis. <laughs> I, did, I honestly haven't, I hadn't thought of that. Um, and so, yeah, that is, that is definitely possible. And that that could be. I, I, I don't know what yeah, the, know the, sure. the natural concentrations in this cloud of, of food residue are relative to what they're taking up. It might be insignificant, but I was just wondering. Yeah, one of the things moving forward too is what we wanted to have was sort of create those microenvironment clouds and see what the actual amount of amino acids coming off them are, because right now it's it's a sort of a I guess a thought that they are producing this just massive amount of amino acids around them, but I'd like to know the actual chemical amount of amino acids that are present in those, in those dissolved organic nutrients. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, the uh, floor is open to any other questions. Okay, I'm, I'm naive about uh, these critters, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw you one, which is, okay. why are they so successful? Oh, the the green crab. Yeah, I just what's, think that because the they have behind this this uh, the global situation. They're pretty much taking over the world, and I, for one, welcome our arthropod overlords. Um, essentially, I mean, the, the reason that they're so successful is because usually, I guess, success for aquatic invaders is usually tied to salinity because that seems to be the major issue in terms of getting over or getting being able to adapt to a new environment. But these guys have an amazing salinity tolerance. So like I said, down to 4 ppt, all the way up to 40. And they can also withstand freshwater for a fair amount of time. Um, they can't live in freshwater, but they can withstand it for, I think it was something like oh, around six hours. I, get, I, got, I need to double check that. But they also have really great oxygen tolerance. So that means they're going to be a lot more um, able to invade into new environments where other crabs might not be able to, that don't have the same sort of oxygen tolerance. And the same thing with temperature. They, they can go from temperatures all the way down from like four degrees all the way up to like 32. Like they're in, they're just their capacity to live in different environments is, is pretty impressive. But I think it's mostly tied to salinity. So my, my thinking on this is an evolutionary biologist is something that's historically restricted their range at some point, right? And there's a cost mm -hmm. to having that broad range of tolerance. So what, what did we do? To, to let this uh, Pandora out of the box here. We put them on the boat. No, I don't know. Honestly, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, I think the only thing that's stopping them, I was going to say, is, is salinity, is fresh water. That's probably where they, they yeah, that will be the, and then they don't like being in 4 PPT either for very long. It's like they're really uncomfortable at that level. Um, but yeah, I think salinity is all, I think is the main driver. Uh, John, John has his real hand up, and there you might get a legitimate physiology question now. Well, no, this is sort of a self-interest yeah. question. Um, what about freshwater crabs? Because if you, you know, 
if it is also tied in, in part to salinity and mm -hmm. part of the ocean regulation, do you, would you predict that they would, you know, salt, well, I mean, freshwater crab would lose that ability? Or do you have anyone checked on it? Or do you so plan we've been looking at freshwater crabs? We, freshwater crabs, again, the same thing. It was, it was thought that they may not have this ability to transfer amino acids, also because they're not going to be in an environment that are rich in amino acids. But then a new theory has kind of come out because, like you said, in the fall, leaves fall off on the trees and you, they make these really, really rich dissolved organic nutrient pools. And so now there's a lot of evidence that crustaceans or even daphnia have the ability to transport amino acids. And we just did this research, a little bit of this research with um, Sally Lee and Greg, um, where we looked at transport of glutamate across the, uh, across the freshwater sponges and they can transport, they can transport amino acids. So I think that, yeah, I think obviously there might be potential for freshwater um, transport, but I have, it's not something that I have um, beyond a little bit of the work with, with Sally, I haven't, I haven't investigated yet. Yeah, just, just the crab just reminded me of the mitten crabs that, you know, would be delicious too. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, those, yeah, those are really invasive, yeah. yeah. Oh, chat questions, I didn't even, I didn't even. Oh, just some gassing going on in the chat. <laughs> uh, there's a question though, how do you expect Oh, there, there is one, sorry, I missed it. How do you expect variation in O2 concentration to affect uptake of leucine given the two functions of the gills? Um, honestly, I don't know. Hypoxia is something that we want to do this summer. In terms of, I don't think it's such a concrete story anymore where it's like anterior is only respiratory, posterior is ionoregulatory. This summer we did test um, a lot of other gills. So we looked at seven, eight, nine, and we also looked at two, three, and four. And Transport rates between the gills were a lot closer than I thought that we would be based on the characteristics. And so I know that a lot of work has been done out of uh, Dirk Weinrose lab, um, looking at um, ammonia transport and also looking at ion transport. And it looks like both anterior and posterior gills have the capacity to transport. So I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm not sure what I would expect with hypoxia just yet, but I do think that we, the gills are more similar than we initially had had thought. Okay, does anybody else uh, have a question for Tim? I don't see any human hands or uh, blue hands or crab claws, so uh, with that, <laughs> I'd like to thank you. That was really that was really interesting, and um, yeah, great great job. Um, you will of course receive a highly coveted um, from the biological scientist inspired discovery for a, a better world water bottle, and uh, Linda will ensure that one of these makes its way to your uh, to your mailbox in the department. And with that, with that, thank you. Um, I'll just. Uh, leave us with a reminder that next month we have Brian Linoil, who will be our, our, our next chair's lecture. And that's going to be on February 11th. So uh, mark your calendars and Brian will tell us something about microorganisms and probably extreme environments or something along those lines. So we'll all be looking forward to that. Tam, thank you again. Wonderful job. And uh, everybody. really good to see everybody here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Brian, you got some time. <laughs> All right. I hope I hope Linda got it right. And you are actually in the dock for uh, for February, but uh, that that doesn't ring a bell for me. I, I think that's right. I just uh, it's just slipped my mind. Oh, that's all right. We're all like that. You only need it. You only need the night before to put some slides together. There you go. Right. <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, thanks, everybody, and um, have a have a pleasant evening. And I, and I hope to see you around soon. Okay. And thank you again, Tim. Well done. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.